Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Kevin Moore Show. Now if you want to stay up to date with all my latest videos, just click that subscribe button below as this really helps to also support the show. If you're new to the show, I interview guests from a spiritual perspective, covering mainstream and alternative subjects and much more. Now on today's show, I'm about to be joined by my guest, Paddy Paul. Now Paddy began conducting workshops on personal and spiritual growth back in 1989. Now she's been a guest speaker at numerous events and hosted her own TV talk show, which was aired in Southern California for 10 years. Now, she joins me today to discuss her journey with exploring channeling and teachings that came from her many sessions she had and her new book, Exploring Other Lifetimes and how they relate to our current life and much more. Patty Paul, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me on your show, Kevin. I've been looking forward to it. Yes, myself as well, absolutely. And you're currently based in California? Yes, I was born in Los Angeles. I grew up in Burbank, which is a distant suburb of Los Angeles. And from there, I've lived in various places in Southern California. Been here in Huntington Beach since 1979. All right. Well, thank you uh, for joining us, like I've said before. What would you say then, if I was to go straight to this question, right, what would you say is the most important message of this book that you've done? The message of this book, um, and mine is a show, and a, this is how I do things. It's not a how-to-tell kind of a book. So the I believe one of the important messages is to show that we have unseen friends, each one of us who are ready, willing, and able to help us, <clears throat> but it's up to us to ask for that help. They don't butt in, they don't take over, and they don't save us, but they're available to help when we ask. And I have a myriad of particular wise being friends, channeled beings who have been there for me in that way. Yes. And this is a very unique journey that you've been on as well. And I don't meet many people who have sort of um, dabbled in, you know, some of the same realms as I'm, you know, currently doing. So it, it's, you know, a pleasure to to rack your brain and uh, you know to to see what your journey's been like as well and, and uh -huh. you know and just how well where you are now as well I mean where you are now you would say you're in a very happy place um yes I I feel that I am more productive more creative happier healthier even than I have been in the past and I have more personal freedom which is extremely important to me Yes, personal freedom. How would you sum that personal freedom up? Well, part of it has to do with, and this is something that I do talk about in my book, having processed the need, the lifelong need that I used to have to have a man in my life. Some may say it goes back to daddy issues, which I had, but I finally reached the point, which I make in my book, that I realized that the real uh, relationship I was seeking was the one with myself and especially the relationship I have with my own internal masculine energy. And when I when I reached that realization and feeling, it's a feeling, and have been able to be more balanced within, you know, the masculine feminine balancing within me, that has freed me 
from that old need of, oh, I need to have a relationship because I, blah, you know, blah, blah, blah. So personal freedom in that way. I live alone. I love living, living alone, but I also love people. And so when I feel like socializing, that's what I do. Yeah, interesting. So this is a very different type of interview because we're obviously going to talk about the exploration of some of your other lifetimes, which you talk about in your book as um, in, happening in real time, basically. They're, they're not past or future as we understand it. And mixing that in with the, your journey in some of the channelers and uh, you know that side of the phenomena that got you into um self-healing in a sense i suppose of on your the journey that you've been on so if we just go back a bit here growing up um was it a difficult type of uh, childhood well um it had its difficulties when i was born way back in 1936 i was born to a woman who was about 36 years old and wasn't married well, that was not a chic thing to do in those days. And so she, I came to learn about this. She felt extreme shame about that, especially since she followed what the Bible says, which is absolutely no sex before you get married. So she had my mother, my grandma raised me, really raised me until I was about four and a half years old. Um, and I never really bonded with my mother. And my grandmother was wonderful and loved me and doted on me. But when I was four and a half, that's when I left grandma's care and went to live with my mother and her new husband. And it became apparent to little me that obviously my mother was not interested or knowledgeable about being a mother. And so I, in my own little way, I realized if anybody's gonna raise me, it's gonna have to be me. So I became very self-dependent uh, at an, or independent, I should say, at an early age and yet the part of me was wounded because in my child brain, and like I didn't parse out these words, but the feeling I had was everybody knows that mothers love their children and take care of their children, but mine isn't doing that for me, so there must be something wrong with me. And that was an underlying feeling I had for most of my life. Okay, so mm -hmm. a bit of a, well, quite a bit of a feeling then of, you know, never feeling truly loved in a sense, or never truly loving yourself. Right, there was okay. something about me, not lovable. Mm -hmm. Right, and we'll get into that further on in the interview as it relates to what you discovered uh, on your journey as well. So um, at a young age as well, alcohol played a part uh, in your process, and we've all had our addictions. None of us are scot-free, right? But alcohol was, was um, oh, I suppose it helped you relax. It helped you, you know, communicate better with people. Um, but obviously, what did that do to you or to your relationships at the time? And, and what was the process of realizing that, you know, none of this was truly going to make you happy? Well, as I got older, um, in my teenage years, I think I was a senior before my little girlfriends and I would get somebody to buy us a six pack of beer. <laughs> and But it evolved because as I, and I do have this very social part of me that really wants to be with people and have fun. But this inner voice was saying, um, sabotaging me in that way, saying, well, you're not good enough. You know, your mother obviously knew you were not good enough to be cared for or even loved. And so the alcohol helped numb those feelings, those suppressed feelings. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is 
for us to recognize those suppressed feelings and to express them in appropriate ways, even feelings from childhood. And there are ways of doing that, but I didn't know any of that. So alcohol was my numbing process. And that allowed me to just open up and have fun and be with the friends until it got to be a problem and a handicap. Mm -hmm. And uh, three marriages? That's true. Yep, three yes. marriages, yeah. You had a, a a daughter in the first marriage, was it? Well, I <clears throat> got married at an early age, 18. And I had a son, have a son who was born when I was 19 and my daughter when I was uh, 21. So... I was a young mother with these two children and married, married, but I was married to a very domineering, controlling, abusive sort. Okay. And that was something Then you look back now, um, there's no blame on, on right. any of that. It, it's just, you know, you learnt, uh, you, I, do you feel that that was something you were destined to do or that was all done with free will? Well, I believe it was part of my overall learning process because after six years, I found the fortitude within myself and the self-worth to say, I'm not putting up with this anymore. And that was a powerful choice, a powerful choice because I took my power back and, um, so that's why I answer your question by saying that experience with him was part of my growth process because it gave me the opportunity to say no more. I'm worth this. I'm not spending the rest of my life like this. As you and I both know, there are married people who stay in marriages for 20, 30 years putting up with it because they believe that's what you're supposed to do. That's what the Bible says. And you understand what I'm getting at here. Absolutely, I do. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of people still now that feel that, you know, marriage is for life, regardless yeah. if it's abusive or not. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And most times when that's taking place, uh, I, I think that uh, the other is so in denial of, of what they're actually doing that they're not aware. Um, and, and that's not an excuse. Um, I just think uh, some of that stuff, it, it, you know, comes from childhood as well. Um, yes, and, and I would say this, Kevin, we are all on our own journey. And those other people, they have their process, their growth process. And each of us, once we move beyond this physical life, we have an opportunity to look back at that life and say, oh, wait a minute, I could have left him or her five years before not 35 well what's one of my favorite sayings is it's uh there are no mistakes just experiences i like <laughs> to say there are synchronicities as well yeah, yes yeah. yes yeah, yeah it's never too late is, is is what you're saying which is which is a great message yeah it's all a learning opportunity yes and you had your brushes with um your own experiences of mental health as well um you mentioned in the book that your your daughter suffered and, and still suffers from that um, so, you know, you, you've had your life's worth of experience on top of that, your second husband as well died in a plane crash. Yes, he did. Yes. That was a shock to put it mildly. Yes. A shock. Um, and we'd been together for a total of seven and a half years. I was 35. He was 19 years older than I. So he was soon to be, uh, 54 or 55, whatever the math is there. And um, yeah, he died in a plane crash. It was a, a business trip that he was on, a private plane leased by his employer. So never a life uh, without, um, uh, well, you know, 
drama and conflict and everything else. Do you know what I mean? Like we all yes, have to I experience. Do. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So this was all driving you on your journey, obviously, right? So we, yes. we get to a point in, I want to say, let's go to 86. And what was the, well, no, let's go to 85, actually, and the two yes. choices that you made. And actually in 1985, where was the drinking at that point as well? Um, I was doing it socially. I didn't really drink at home, but I was going out quite a bit and I was drinking and smoking. Those two things seem to go together so <laughs> nicely. I know, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was just part of my social activities. And back in those days, everybody was doing it, honestly. You know, it was nowadays. A lot of people, I guess, have given up drinking or never started. But that was part of the thing to do. And um, it was a social activity back then. And the, the critical moment in the year 1985, the life changer for me, was in July of 85 and my third marriage was which was brief had just recently ended by mutual agreement and that's when I at home alone in my nice condo on a Sunday afternoon sat myself down on my couch and decided I'm going to you know do some self searching here which I did for several hours, reviewed my life. Uh, and I came to the conclusion and there are steps, important steps that I did, things that I looked at, all of that I cover in chapter one of my book. But there came a point when I realized, because I saw similarities. Well, I'll say this, I, I was reviewing also these various men that had been in my life, the three husbands and two other long-term relationships. And I was musing to myself how different each of those men were, different educations, different jobs, different ages. And I thought, okay, the one thing they have in common is me. And that's when I thought, aha, if my life's going to change, I'm going to change. And then I also, at that time, decided that I had put my spiritual journey on the back burner while I raised my two kids, but they were young adults on their own now. So I made the choice also to begin to explore my, my spiritual self Religion had never resonated with me, but metaphysics always had. And so with those two critical choices, my whole life changed direction. I began to get all this information coming my way, books and all kinds of, it was a, like a door opened and all of this information flowed to me that I could use and that helped me embark on a new journey if we go then to maybe 1986 when yes. uh shirley mclean uh brought her famous book out and i'll get you just to describe what happened there well actually in 1985 after i made those two choices one of the things i found out about right off the bat was shirley mclean's book out on a limb, which actually she had published a couple of years before. So I read Out on a Limb, and I had read other of Shirley's books, but this one just had something in it that piqued my interest. And it was her reference to attending a meeting where a channel being spoke their wisdom to the group of people there. And I really had not heard much about channel beings, had no idea how I could possibly 
you know, be in, uh, hear one speak or be in attendance, but I just knew channel being that is my source of this new information I needed to grow and change. And then within a couple of days, oh, and in Shirley's book, she mentioned particularly Ramtha, a channel being channeled by Jay-Z Knight. So within a couple of days, as all of this information was coming my way and I was reading the various self-help books that were out at that time, it came to me that I'd like to visit my lifelong friend, Barbara, who lived in Colorado. And here I am in California. I had just started a job, so I didn't, wasn't able to take time off from work. So I was just gonna do this for the weekend, which, seemed crazy, but I called Barbara. There's this inner voice that just says, you've got to do this. I called Barbara. Sure enough, fine, come visit. She picked me up at the airport. And Barbara had been a metaphysician for many years. And so I knew she'd understand about my interest in hearing a channeled being. And in fact, she had also read uh, Shirley MacLaine's book and she told me on the ride home to her place that she had two videos by uh, Ramtha. Each was about an hour and a half, two hours long. Would I like to watch those when I got there? I said, I sure would. So when I got to her house, I didn't even unpack. I sat there mesmerized before these two, you know, watching these two videos. So that was my first exposure in that way to a channel being. Okay, so then when did you uh, move on from Rantha then? What was the journey then? Well, I'll tell you the one key thing that Rantha said that really resonated with me was you create your own reality. When I heard that, I knew it was true. Somehow I knew it was true. So I listened to a lot of Ramtha tapes, audio tapes, and watch videotapes. My friend Barbara um, and I ended up going to a week-long Ramtha workshop at Estes Park in Colorado. Barbara and I were roommates and we attended that. But the thing was, Kevin, Ramtha, I started to notice that Ramtha was contradicting themselves. On the one hand, they said, you create your own reality. But on the other hand, they were saying, and we, I will send you runners. I will do this for you. I think the, the final straw for me, being a lifelong Californian, was when Ramtha said, California is going to fall into the ocean in a, you know, not too long time. And here I'm living two miles from the Pacific Ocean. And I said, no, wait a minute. I create my own reality. I'm not creating that. And so that pretty much finished it for me with Ramtha. But I had at my house a videotape that I had rented from my local metaphysical store around the tape. And the arrangement was when I took this tape back to this store, they had another one waiting for me. So I thought, okay, I'll watch that. But when I got to that store, the owner said, oh, that romp the tape never came back, but I think you'll like this one. And they handed me a videotape by this being friend called Lazarus, channeled by Jack Purcell. The, vi the video was turned out to be the very first one that Lazarus made, um, was called Awakening the Love. And in the group of people, in this video, listening to Lazarus, I noticed Shirley MacLaine was there. Um, at any rate, Lazarus said, you create your own reality, no ifs, ands, or buts. And the other things they said, 
let me know that, yes, this is the one I know who will be able to give me the information that I need to grow and change. I don't know how I'm going to grow and change. I don't know what that means, but I just knew they were the source. And that began a long relationship with with uh, my unseen friend, Lazarus. That's incredible. So um, I've heard of Lazarus, uh, as you say, channeled by uh, Jack Purcell. I believe he's still alive. I believe he's still with oh, us. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, yeah, go ahead. All right. I was going to say, I, I went to my first... Oh, yes, I was listening or I watched that videotape that I rented that I mentioned. I went back and there were several others that I rented. And then I found out that the first or there would be an in-person workshop given by Ramtha, uh, sorry, Lazarus, on a certain Sunday at a hotel in Los Angeles called and that was called your unseen friends so i made sure that i bought a ticket to to attend that it was just an afternoon session and i went there that was my first in person uh, uh workshop that uh, that i attended of lazarus's and that was in april of 1986 after that and they were located in Channel, uh, Jack Purcell living in Southern California. So many, many of their workshops, most of them actually, were in Southern California. I went to every single one. Sometimes they would repeat the same workshop up in San Francisco. I went to that too. In the meantime, I was listening to all of these audio tapes, videotapes. I just wanted to immerse myself. And I was learning so much, so, so much. Not just learning this stuff, Kevin, but I began doing the work, living my life according to what I was learning. And believe me, I was using my discernment. I was not just following because you know, blindly, not blind faith at all. And right away, I started manifesting by doing the work, doing the processes, all the steps, manifesting miraculous things. You know, I could give you an example if you like, but uh, it was just immediately changing my life. Well, yeah, how does Lazarus uh, teach us to manifest then yeah there this is this is very complex it's not complicated but there are many pieces to it in the beginning and believe me these truths are expanding and so as Uh, the way I put it, and this is a suggestion Lazarus made way back then. It's important to stand firmly on my own convictions and then raise up on my toes and reach for a higher truth. For there will always be a higher truth. And a higher truth is one that requires more responsibility for creating your reality and rewards you with more personal freedom. So it's an ongoing process. Back in the beginning of my experience with Lazarus, what I was learning, one of the things was we manifest with four, with raw materials, beliefs and attitudes, thoughts and feelings, choices and decisions, and oh, Chris, it's been a long time since I thought about these beliefs and attitudes, thoughts and feelings, choices and decisions. Oh, there is another one. I 
I could look it up, but but anyway, those are the raw materials. And then the tools that we use, Kevin, to work with those raw materials, our imagination, our desire, and our expectation. So if one creates a reality that they do not like, something in their life that is painful, you know, or hurtful or awful. And I learned how the processes to do this, the techniques to do this, you look at your beliefs. What would a person have to believe to create this? And then there are ways of going to that place to get at the bottom of beliefs and there are techniques. Yes, because this is where it ties back into your journey of exploring your your lives and and how they have been uh, affecting you uh, in all um, all the processes up to the point where you started to look at them right so um, and I want to get into that just sticking with the the, the channeled beings I, I love what you say that you know your discernment meter is if um, well one of them is you know if they don't speak about reality creation then um, you know that we create our own reality that that that's yes. a red flag for you but also as yes. well um, uh, you're more of a, um, would you say you, you go towards the sort of trance channelers more than the sort of, you know, conscious channeling that's kind of modern right now in a sense? It was out there before, but it's much more sort of the flavor right now. Do you know what I mean? I do know. Um, yes. I have, yeah, I have, I have uh, certain unseen friends, wise beings, I refer to them in my book, who are channeled. And in attending Lazarus's event, uh, workshops and other events, um, I'm, I met certain people who are also human beings, also learning these same things. We each create our own reality. And as it turned out, each one of us in our own time, we took channeling classes from Sean Randall and her being friend, Tora. And Sean Randall is a internationally known channel and has been giving channeling classes probably since I would say the, perhaps the late seventies, early, early eighties. Uh, and it is actually Tora, the being, who conducts the classes. And my friends that I had met at Lazarus, fellow metaphysicians also held this belief. We each create our own reality, very self-empowering. So naturally the beings that they channel support that. And these beings, only want to be known as friends. None of them, the ones that I include in my resources, none of them call themselves gurus, teachers, mentors. There's no hierarchical system. They're way past that limitation. And so if somebody wants to take something away from my book, I would say um, pay attention to your source of information and guidance. And if they start giving you rules and regulations or telling you what you should do and shouldn't do, my suggestion would be to run the other way because they're trying to take away your power. Yeah, and maybe that's not um, maybe that's not you know um, what they feel that they're doing. They feel that they're doing the right thing, but um, f yeah, for you, uh, this has been um, a, a great way of discerning for you as well. And yes. you know, and a lot of them, well, some of them are also um, they 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 tend to get into the conspiracy side a bit as well, which I've noticed. And um, I don't think that's helpful for anyone, but you tell me your opinion. Uh -huh. Well, that I'm not exposed to, but, you know, um, 
getting back to the relationship between a human channel and their being or beings, whoever they're channeling, there is a rapport there because the human being has their own beliefs. And if that human being subscribes to things like conspiracies and um, the devil and, um, you know, those, they will attract a being who supports that. Not all non-physical beings are wise. Uh Uh-uh. Oh, no, no, no. And especially the ones that have been physical at one time or another. The being friends that I have, the channel beings, have never been physical. They come from higher realms of consciousness and of uh, wisdom. And the, be- the human beings who channel them are trans channels, which means they get their own consciousness out of the way, their own belief system out of the way. It doesn't filter that valuable information. So I'm very particular about who I open myself to. And are they living their truth as well? Well, as they know it. Yeah. Yeah. We each are on our own spiritual journey, our own soul's journey. I have no idea what anybody else's is. So I have no business telling them what they should do, shouldn't do, unless they ask. You know, if somebody asks me what I'd suggest. What do you think those that channel, you know, God energy or source, how does that make you feel? I don't have a feeling about it. They're following what makes sense to them. You know, the things that I talk about, Kevin, and write about might not make sense to anybody else on this planet. And I could care, you know, I don't care. And that's why other people who are devout fundamentalist Christians or uh, uh, devout Muslims, I respect them. They're following their beliefs that make sense to them based on what they've learned so far. I follow my beliefs based on what I've learned and continue to learn. But yeah, that's why we're unique, you know? Absolutely. And when you were doing this process in the early, you know, well, mid, uh, mid 80s, 86 onwards, you know, this was still pretty fringe at that point as well you know it's one thing to go see a medium or um, a a psychic or whatever right but but the channeling side um that's completely different because to some that would look so odd when you know when they're bringing that that energy through yeah sure but that never put you off no because i was ready for it we're not all the same we don't come into this lifetime at square one We come into our lifetime, and this is much of what I learned from Lazarus in the beginning. Before we enter a lifetime, we in our soul choose seven focuses for the upcoming lifetime. The first two are the same for everybody, to learn how to have fun and to consciously create success. The other three are unique. So in order to create an environment when we're alive that will allow us to learn these things, um, one selects other beings to be our nuclear family because those ones have things to learn. So you see... The, the woman who I chose, or the being I chose, had her things to learn. And so we came to an agreement. Naturally, when you're born, you forget all of that. Yes. And, and you made sure that whatever you were receiving advice from, you know, whatever, you know, you were taking, yeah, I want to use the word truth that, that became your truth, or, or maybe you can have a better yes, word for it, right? my truth, yeah, absolutely. right. Um, and, and you made sure that, um, well, you have to make sure, don't you, that you, know, you have to be aware that obviously, you know, um, that, you know, that we all have um, 
we all have, we all suffer from mental health illness, illness at some time, right? But you know, <laughs> we're, we're all able to self correct it normally, right? But there are those out there where that mental health masquerades and it's not always obvious right so there's no you know qualifying you know um test that you have to take to publicly become a channeler but again that has to be in your discernment as well that you're not being misled just because someone says they're channeling right you know uh, th there has to be uh, like you say some sort of basis there but my most important point really is in saying this is that it has to be of practical use as well of what they're they're teaching uh well and then practical, that's a subjective word as well. I would say that everyone should use their own discernment and listen to that inner voice, that intuition. Um, yes, there are not just channels, but psychics, quote unquote, palm readers, quote unquote, who some people are drawn to because, um, well, we each have our individual reasons for doing anything, but some people want to be told what they should do, what they should not do. And then they pay lots of money for someone to do that. And this is how one gives away their power. Yes, and I ref I bring that up considerably in different chapters of so my book. That's an important part as well. Just you know, with your discernment processes, yeah, to, to make sure that it's it's you. You are the one that that has the the um, the gift, the power, in the sense to to um, to find all answers lie within. I guess that's that's what I'm trying to say, and that's what you discovered as well. Uh, when you were with a particular channel, and you can fill the blanks in here, and you, um, for example, there was something that uh, you was asking this particular channel, whether there was a connection with a past life, maybe with, with, with some of the issues that you felt that you were, would yeah. like to work on. And rather than them tell you the past lives that were causing the issues, they told you to go within. And that's where you started using self-guided meditation. So tell us about that process. Well, it wasn't quite as cut and dried at that, as that. I would say when I was just embarking on this new journey and attending all of these Lazarus events and putting to use these valuable processes and things, I was, I was fortunate enough to have two consultations on the phone with Lazarus. They were doing that back in this those days. They have stopped doing that long ago. And so, and I also had what is called an hour-long life reading. In that hour-long life reading, Lazarus spoke to me specifically about five lifetimes that I had and told me the some of the details. Also, the importance for me to go into meditation, and there were specific ways to do that, to visit the lifetime and learn about it, get to know and understand. So that was important. And that is uh, part of the beginning of my book. After that, you know, Kevin, as I've grown, grown and changed and been, I know how to do this on my own. So I do these soul, soul guided meditations, many of them, where I go into my normal meditation process, which is essentially self-hypnosis, you know, and I call forth my soul. And I, for instance, mentioned to my soul that I would like to visit a lifetime that also was a writer. And I would ask my soul to transport me there. And this I describe in my book, how that happens. And then I find myself in a place and meet one who was a writer. 
me, that aspect of me in that lifetime. So I don't always know where I'm going to go. And it takes a certain level of expertise, which I have developed to be able to do these things. Yeah. We, we talked about, um, you know, we, we've all got, we all come in here with things that we want to heal. And you know, even, even you've said to me before, you know, when you meet difficult people or you have difficult situations in your life, you know, by, by, by doing what you've done and looking within and going on, you know, by self-guided meditation, you're able to see, you know, where these people or where these situations fit into lives that were having an effect on this current one. So, yes. and I, I really want you to tell the story, but I just want to add as well that, uh, you know, you do feel that with your work that you've done that, uh, you know, we, we live in a, a multi-dimensional level of consciousness and these lives are all happening now. That is true. In fact, I have in front of me, I could, because I want to get the wording right, because it capsulizes pretty well. Um, at this point with my book, I'm in the process of promoting it, getting it out there. And part of the promotional process is what's called a cell sheet. I'm holding it up. On the back of the cell sheet, I have like a summary of what's in my book. And this little paragraph tells what it's about. This book, unlike others about reincarnation, is based upon the premise that all lifetimes are happening now, not in the past or the future, but right now on levels of multidimensional consciousness existing far beyond the time and space boundaries of the physical realm. I like to liken that to going into a multiplex theater with a thousand screens, all playing different movies at the same time. And I get to choose which ones I wanna see and which ones and in what order. It's a soul, you know, a mutual soul and I make those choices. Yes, absolutely. And, th and this is not what some refer to as the multiverse. I would have to ask that person what they mean, because I can't assume. I will say this, I am aware there are multiverses. Yes, we live in a universe. Planet Earth is in this particular universe, but there are other universe, uh, multi, yeah, there are other universes. And I have lifetimes in those too. Yeah, yeah. The universe is that never end and they're infinite. It's, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Th some things aren't, aren't fathomable. Um, even the idea that this universe goes on forever is, is, is so... Um, it's expanding is uh, what it's doing. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Um, <laughs> so... Okay, let's go to a scenario then. So what was one of the things that uh, in, in one of these lifetimes that's documented in your book that you knew you had an issue and you, uh, you wanted to heal this issue? So going into a previous lifetime or um, a lifetime that was taking place now um, that you were able to go into that and whatever you saw or witnessed, you were able to heal the issue in the now. So tell us about one of those stories. Yes, there were several of them believe me more than just several in my book but the shortest one i mean that won't involve too much of an explanation was a lifetime where no i made the decision as i as i was you know writing the book and i pretty much knew how i wanted the book to go in certain a series of events and yet anybody can pick up any chapter and read it and it stands alone but I was thinking about when I used to have the drinking problem and so I decided I'd like to go to a lifetime that also a lesser I, a lifetime I refer to it not bad not wrong just lesser you know more limited and so I did a meditation and I was taken to um, a lifetime in the second civilization of Atlantis, 
where in this six, seven, second civilization of Atlantis, it was not too long before the ending of that civilization, the destruction. The society, the mainstream society, looked down on people who did not believe the same things, who are not upright citizens, so to speak. They looked down on homeless people, addicts, anyone they considered um, lesser. And so they would shun them. And so when I arrived first in my meditation, I wanted to go as an observer. When I arrived there through meditation, I was in an alleyway, a dirty alleyway, alleyway, and there was a young man sitting on the dirt, um, thin, uh, derelict looking. And I described this more fully in this chapter. And it was obvious that he was a drug addict. Um, there's more to this, but he was one of the outcasts. That's what they call them, outcasts. Anybody who didn't fit in. So on my second meditation, I went in to communicate with this one. And I sat with them and I introduced myself and I began talking with them, and um, he just felt worthless, useless. And in a third meditation, I wanted to exactly experience what that felt like to be that one, hopeless, helpless, afraid of dying, and yet knowing you have no hope feeling, being filled with dread. That was one of the lifetimes, a lesser lifetime, a more limited lifetime. One thing I'd like to go back to, because you've mentioned it in a way, each of us has lesser selves, lesser facets of who we are right now. Patty Paul has aspects, facets that are lesser, the ones that judge others, criticize others, um, and one's, you know, oneself. Those are part of the chauvinist mindset, chauvinist elements of who we are. But the good news is each of us has more uh, enlightened parts, um, more well, wiser and more loving and caring, far more of those. My book, so much of the part, first part of it was dealing with these lesser selves. Like I would meet someone in my Patty Paul life who was, shall we say, prejudiced extremely prejudiced. And this was something that I had avoided, you know, I'm aware and a caring person, but it was a shock to have someone, I'm thinking of someone I dated actually, who would say these horrible things about different races. But by this time I had started this journey. So I would go home and wonder, okay, what part of me is this reflecting? Because I believe that in our reality, we either create a projection of parts of ourselves or reflections. And when it's a reflection, then it's an opportunity to go to that lifetime and embrace it. Right. So by embracing it, do you think then that was the healing for you? Yes. Yeah, it's as simple as that. Well, it's to, when I go into a lifetime, especially when I know I'm going to encounter 
a lesser self, a lifetime where I lived like this derelict. I go in, Kevin, with compassion and understanding, not judgment, not condemning them, but compassion and understanding. And like with this man, this young man that I'm talking about, there came a point in my meditation where, as I recall, I embraced him. And also there's a level of self-forgiveness and understanding, embraced him, integrated him to, into the whole that I am because I am so much more than just this Patty Paul person as we all are. We have our truer self is a greater being that also exists right now. So for me, it's embracing that one, recognizing them. I always invite them to share their thoughts and feelings and then I integrate them into the whole and that brings about a healing. Yes, it does. Right. Do you think that's healing to that life that's taking place as we think of as past as well, not just this present one that you're focused on? Do you think it's absolutely it's reciprocal, right? Yes. It's a healing across the board, all the lifetimes healing at once. It's a ripple effect. So maybe yeah. that homeless aspect of yourself that you saw maybe went on to do something else that No, it, it I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it doesn't work like that. They are who they are. And there's no need to change them. There's no need to fix them. Still they on, are. They're still on their own personal journey. Accept yeah. them mm -hmm. and love them as they are. That's called unconditional love. Okay. Wow. That's powerful. And, you know, you document, I think, uh, 30 something of the uh, 80 sort of lifetimes that you've. Uh, uh, researched i want to use that word but maybe that's not the right word but that gotten to know yeah, yeah, gotten gotten to know. To know. yeah yeah and um this has been a continuous healing journey for you you know when, when you've done this um yeah i mean it's, it's you know I, I just found it so you know powerful what you're what you're saying because you know you're not needing anyone you're your own power you know and some may say but there's no proof there's no proof but the proof for you, the practicality for you is in what it's done to enrich your happiness and yes. any, anything that you were having issues with, um, you've been able to, you know, uh, work on that by, by using this technique. Yes. Getting back to the drinking issue that I had for quite a while. As I was learning all of these wonderful things primarily from Lazarus in the beginning. Since then, I have these other wonderful friends. And um, I was learning how to love myself. I was learning how to heal, how to express my emotions appropriately. And it was filling up that empty hole inside of me that I used to try to fill up with alcohol. Some people do it with drugs. Some people do it with golf and, so, you know, playing golf, TV, whatever that um, addictive food, you know, people who are three, four, 500 pounds. So I was healing, filling up that emptiness inside. And so it was easy on Easter day, Sunday in 1991 for me to put down a glass of champagne that had just been poured for me. I had taken one sip. I didn't like what it was doing to my thinking, which was always what I looked for in the past. I put that down. I put down my cigarette and I said, no more. Have not had the slightest urge for either either of those things. Right, but it also could have been the effect could have been maybe whether it's just a, a bit more imbalance. It's not the absence of anything. It's just you know imbalance. If you can keep addictions in balance, right? I'm just yeah, we, yeah. yeah. Not yeah. everybody has that problem. I yeah. had a problem. No, no I'm saying I'm saying that that, that uh, yes, that to live this life. 
uh, you know, could we do those things that you that you stopped more, just a, a bit more in balance? Does it have to be the the stopping of everything, <laughs> or you no. know, no, no, because it's a different uh -uh. journey for everyone. That's my point. I guess I'm making that is. I agree with that. Everybody has a different life and different experiences and different opportunities. But it's incredible with this type of technique that you've that you've been doing the self guided meditations and you know the the work um, you know with with channelers as well to to work on yourself that, of, of what you're able to to heal for yourself as well just by yourself and yes. you know I mean God I mean. None of us, uh, um, there's no free ticket here. You know, we've all got things we're working on. And sometimes our addictions take our lives. I mean, that's, you know, it happens. I mean, yeah. you know, I've had a, a friend that, that, that had that uh, same experience and, you know, he's no longer with us. Um, and, uh, but there's no judgment there. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's just, you know, uh, there is so much healing in, in in doing what you're doing when you went to atlantis as well was it a sort of technologically oh. advanced civilization at that time i many of the chapters in my book are about lifetimes in atlantis the first civilization of atlantis the second civilization the third and then there towards the end because as my book progresses I move towards the more enlightened aspects of who I am that also exist. So I went to an Atlantis that still exists, that never was destroyed. And I describe in detail what the society is like. They all live in peaceful cooperation. That is an amazing chapter. Yeah. I've you yeah, know, that's yeah. incredible. What What about the idea of future lives as well affecting this present moment? Well, but then again, it's all one, isn't my, it? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, they're all happening now. No future, no past. All happening right now. Like that movie theater, we get to choose which we want to visit. And but when did you go to see any lives? Have you seen any lives where it's more technologically advanced than now? Yes. 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 In fact, the two of the Atlantis civilizations that ended up being destroyed evolved to the point where they were highly advanced, but they evolved to the point where they prized technology, and I would say commerce and money, over people. The current situation in this world has echoes of that Atlantis to civilization. Um, not to mean that this, we're gonna, you know, it's gonna fall apart. It's just that some of those same issues that were problems back in those days where people who didn't believe a certain way, Christianity, were seen to be wrong um, and won't go to heaven or the rapture or any of that. You know what I'm saying? The modern utopia Atlantis that you went to, it's almost mm -hmm. like that the, the past is the future <laughs> in some respects. Well, uh, it's a possibility for the future. It is. Yes, for this, you know. Deep stuff. <laughs> well, yes, it, it takes a a broader view of reality, less the linear cause and effect and more the bigger picture here. Um, imagine living in a society where we agree to live together in peaceful cooperation. That means you have your religion or your spiritual beliefs, fine, do your own thing and not be self-righteous thinking I'm right. And you, if you don't believe the way I do, I have permission to do anything to destroy you. But you have had visions in your self-guided meditations of a paradise that one could say uh, in this linear time that uh, we're, we're having this conversation is a future version of this. Well, it's not a future, but it's actually happening. It's happening. And I visited something. And here, 
there's always higher truths, Kevin. So we create our own reality. I'm using my hands a lot. <laughs> Try to tone you're, it you're down. Channeling. <laughs> uh, myself. Yeah. I am channeling myself. Um, we continue to create our own reality after we're no longer physical. So when we're in these other planes of reality, we can create anything we want. And if we're wiser and more loving and more understanding, we want to create beautiful realities, beautiful gardens. And so some of my last few chapters are about that, where I go in meditation. I have these wonderful experiences of the beauty. And in some of them, my metaphysical friends are with me. Some of the same ones I know in this time period, some of them from Sirius, some from uh, Lemuria and Atlantis. And in some of the uh, lives that, that you've explored, when you're looking to heal issues that, you know, are personal, that, you know, maybe you've never told anyone, right? Whatever it may be. And we've all got, you know, issues that, that we're, we're trying to deal with. Um, did you find that there were aspects of you causing these issues where you were quite surprised with some of the actions that you were doing in other lives that were taking place? Um, I was surprised, yes, at some of the events two lifetimes in particular. Um, where, and in fact, both of those lifetimes, and I knew one was going to be chapter, I'm looking at my list here, one was going to be chapter five. And I knew about that lifetime, Marcos in Greece, ancient Greece. And I would go in meditation and learn some things, but I had to skip that chapter because there was some part of me that was really reluctant about going there. And I finally did what I needed to do to clear that out of the way because I wanted it to be chapter five it was important. So I experienced it and I found out some shocking thing that happened. And that was the same with another lifetime called Gavril in ancient Greece, where he was a professor and um, spoke out about everyone is equal, women are equal to men. And this was at the rise of Christianity. And of course, the Christian beliefs are that men are superior, men are the authorities, women are subservient. And his life ended in a very shocking way. And I was with him in meditation. And I was shocked. I was surprised. Do you think that some of these people whose lives seem just out of control, you know, and that they've, they've done some really um, horrible things to others. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and do you think, obviously, there's free will in our actions in what we do right now, right? So if I'm going to go do something, uh, you know, uh, that wasn't very nice, uh, you know, I've got the free will to do it. I choose not to do that, obviously, because I would not want to hurt anyone, right? Um, but uh, some people uh, whose... Um, impulses to do certain things do you think they're impulses from other lifetimes that are taking place that they've not healed at the same time you know it's hard for me to give a blanket answer because each individual has their own unique reasons i would say every lifetime even the ones where they that being does horrible horrible things jeffrey dahmer every lifetime is an opportunity to learn something about oneself. Now, some people who do really evil things, they're so caught up in it that they're not going to learn that in the lifetime. But when they leave the lifetime, they have an opportunity to look back and say, oh, yeah. 
But do you think as a soul, we're aware when we incarnate back here, wherever here is right now, but this this point of uh, consciousness that we've got right now, right? That yeah. that the soul's aware that actually these other lifetimes taking place, it's going to affect this one. It, it no only knows that coming down here, but it doesn't well, care. Well, there's, there's an influence, but other lifetimes do not make you do what you do. I do not, I do not believe in karma. No, that's giving power away to some. No, I don't subscribe to karma. But I would say that there are other lifetimes that influence. And in fact, that's what I talk about in my book. You know, when I have, when I meet somebody, let's say a man who is just obnoxious and uh, misogynist and all that and I get really angry inside because here I am a woman living in this quote unquote man's world a higher truth is I help create that but that's when I would as a more enlightened being do a meditation okay I'm going to call forth that aspect of myself who is being reflected by that particular man. And I'm going to ask that one also in meditation, what are your thoughts and feelings? What are you angry about? And again, just embrace them and love them and, and not criticize. We all have these parts of ourselves. Oh, absolutely. And I think this is a great way practically as well to, you know, to help help, you know, heal some of that if we so choose to, um, you know. If we so choose. Yeah, yeah, we don't have to. Uh, they'll, you know, we've done this many times before and we'll be doing it many times again. Um, but it is this this present moment right now is the one that's really important. This is where we're we're right now me and you are focused on regardless of what else may be going on uh this is the one to heal and you know if we if we can sort our issues out here now regardless of what we've done it i, I guess it's very it's a good thing to do for wherever we're heading to do you know what i mean to, to clear up some of the crap that we leave behind well that's what i would like my book to inspire people to do because i'm showing this is what I've done. This is what works for me. This is how I'm growing and changing. And well, the results I have at this age, I have a wonderful life. Now it's up to people whether or not they're going to listen or watch. What are some of your channelers or are there that you uh, sort of uh, appreciate right now? Or, or you know, you, you would say that they're, they're someone that you uh, has, has been very helpful for you still? Yes, my... A uh, particular channel being friends that had in some way uh, contributed to my book. I'll just focus on those. Um, my being friend, Eleanor, who is channeled by a metaphysician, Steve, who, one of whom I met, you know, he's one I met at a Lazarus event long ago. I've had personal consultations with Eleanor um, at first for many years. It was monthly. Now it's every other month. I wanted to take the training wheels off. Um, and so Eleanor has helped me so much dealing with my own issues. Also, suggesting that I have other lifetimes I want to examine. With that in mind, I want to hold this up because when, oh, we do. All right. Well, anyway, these are, this is a picture of audio tapes, the old fashioned Sony tape recorded tapes that I made with my consultations with Eleanor and a few others. And so that was part of my resource for writing these chapters. And also here's another, a bin of files that have the notes that I've kept since 1986 about these lifetimes. And if, if there was one channeler now that's out there that you appreciate, or you, you would say that, that they're worth look, looking into, would there be any names or name? Lazarus. Even though Lazarus 
is not going to be doing public, um, I mean, large uh, events. They, Lazarus and Jack Purcell are, are produced, shall we say, their backup is called Concept Synergy. And if somebody, um, you know, got con Google Concept Synergy, they would get the website. All of the tapes and workshops and things are available there. I would say that answers your question right off the bat. Absolutely does. And also there's a YouTube channel, which we're linking in the description below, which was a talk uh -huh. show that you started or did around yeah. 1995. And there's about 57 interviews there uh, of channelers back in the day that yeah. you got to interview, which is incredible. Yes, and they're Eleanor and Tora and some of these others I've mentioned. Yes, those videos are up there on YouTube. I'm not trying to sell anything. I just wanted to get the information out there. And they're being watched w worldwide by an audience. Thank you for doing that back in the day. Um, we're very much out of time right now. But oh. what, would, what would be an important message just to leave the audience with, Patty? Take responsibility for creating your own reality and quit blaming. <laughs> Does that sum it up? <laughs> Stop blaming. Our favorite thing is to blame. Take responsibility. Your book, Patty, is available uh, on all good websites. And the book has been coming up on the screen as well. I've really enjoyed the time that I've had with you. It's gone very quick and we barely got into some of the meat and bones, but I think we've managed to at least, you know, give people uh, uh, some rather important um, information that you've, that, of, of what your journey has been and just what you've had to share. So just thank you so, so much. Oh, thank you for this opportunity. You've asked some really good questions and I hope that I've answered most of them. Thank you so much, Kevin.